Hello, everyone. Are you ready for a great conversation? All right. Okay, I am Nancy Lin. I help organize events for Taiwan Cafe, which co-hosts tonight's event. Um, so I want to welcome everybody um, for joining us tonight. Uh, we have 150 people sign up for tonight's event. So I think some of them might be coming later. So try to move to the front if you can. Um, so to leave some space for people who are coming uh, and joining us later. Um, we also have 400 people tuning in online uh, from around the world. So it's uh, very exciting to have everybody gathering together to talk about something that's really important, and that's democracy. Um, so thank you so much for coming here. And I also want to thank Ruber for offering us such a great, uh, wonderful space. And I want to give a special thanks and shout out to Ru Flores, who have helped us, yes, put together the program tonight. And we couldn't have done it without her her, uh, her help. So let's keep her, wait, I'm just like watching her, like walking out. I was going to say that we should just give her a big round of applause and thanking her for all the work that she has put in. Thank you, Ru. Somewhere in the room. Thank you, Ru. All right. Um, I wanted to say that um, Audrey Tang is probably one of the most intelligent people I ever interviewed. Um, and if not the most. Um, and um, she has some really interesting um, and unique and even philosophical perspectives on a lot of uh, topics uh, or the challenges that we face right now. Um, so I want to encourage everybody here tonight uh, to take full advantage of the Q&A session and get her take on any issues that might concern you. Um, I think this is a perfect um, time to do that tonight. Um, and um, before we do that, I wanted to just take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about Taiwan Cafe. Uh, we are a meetup group. We got started last year. Um, we want this to be a place, not just for cultural exchange, but also a place where people can exchange ideas, ideas for things that are really relevant to most of us, such as democracy. And, and we have some really interesting programs coming up. Um, next month, for example, we have a networking event at a brewery in Oakland. Um, you're gonna have some fun meeting new people, but we also gonna share perspectives on um, empathy. Um, by using, um, or I should say, by discussing an HBO program, The World Between Us. So if you're looking for something different to do, this might be a place for you. Um, and also, I want to mention that in September, we're hosting a panel discussion to talk about how to bring meaning to your work. How can you make your work more purposeful um, so that you're not just doing it for a paycheck? Um, and I think you're going to get a lot of inspiration from our panel, uh, which will include some corporate leaders as well as um, the first female baseball umpire in Taiwan. Um, so it's really interesting program. So check us out on meetup.com or follow us on Facebook. Um, now I want to take a few minutes to introduce you um, tonight's moderator, Keith Manconi. Um, I can't think of a better person to run tonight's program. Um, he really is the perfect uh, moderator for this program. Um, he actually spent five years in Taiwan working as a journalist uh, for ICRT, which is a very well-respected English language radio station in Taiwan. Um, he's now back in Bay Area, uh, again working as a journalist as well as a producer for KCBS radio all news radio station. So some of you might recognize his voice. Um, so let's give him a huge welcome. Hello, Keith, come on up. So lucky to have you here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, appreciate right. it. I'm gonna hand it over to you, take all it right. from here. Sounds good, all right. all right. I think I'm mic'd up, all right. I got it, thank you. Thank you guys all for coming out, great to see you. One more quick thing about me that my boss is making me say. Uh, I am not speaking on behalf of uh, my employer, KCBS. Made me say that, so I've said it. We're done. All the legalities out of the way. Well, uh, so we're here to talk about Audrey Tong, and uh, there is a lot to get to. It's honestly a little bit difficult to know where to start a conversation about Audrey Tong. Uh, just running through the list of possible starting points is a little bit diz dizzying. Uh, as you guys probably know, she is a minister without portfolio for the Republic of China described as Taiwan's digital minister. 
This makes her the country's first transgender minister. And when she first began uh, her role in her mid-30s, she was also the country's youngest minister ever. So we've got a couple of superlatives already. And that's pretty interesting in its own right, but that doesn't really even scratch the surface of what Audrey Tang is bringing to the table. If we wind the clock back a little bit further, uh, we'll find some more interesting stuff. She dropped out of school at a young age and went to start her own company in her teens. Uh, then she stepped away from all that and put uh, in her early 30s, so retiring in her early 30s, already having a lot of uh, interesting work under her belt. She then put her considerable talents to use uh, developing internet projects, forwarding various social causes, uh, most notably in 2014. Uh, that work included a little bit of IT support for Taiwan's largest upsurge in civil unrest in a generation. It's known as the Sunflower Movement. It was a nearly months-long occupation of the legislative UN pretty much the most, the largest political event that we've seen in quite a long time in Taiwan. So very pivotal moment. She was right there on the ground floor. Uh, it played a pretty interesting role in it too. We can maybe hear a little bit more about that as we uh, get further into our conversation. On top of all of that, uh, Audrey Tong is also a self-described conservative anarchist. Those are the words that she uses. Uh, and we can unpack that a little bit too as well. So it's easy to see that we have a lot of threads to unspool this evening, a lot of different interesting things to talk about. Uh, and we are hoping that through the course of this conversation, uh, it can really be driven by the audience. So I'm going to be up here asking a couple of questions to get us started, planning maybe 20, 25 minutes of a Q&A between myself and Audrey. But what we're really hoping is that this can be driven by your interests, whatever you guys are interested in hearing about tonight. So I'm going to just kind of do a lightning round through some of the major topics that we're going to be discussing this evening. What I'm hoping you'll do while we have that lightning round is uh, think to yourself where you might want to explore further and think about questions that you want once we get to the audience portion of the show. So please uh, keep that in mind. Uh, I guess we should uh, welcome on now to the stage Audrey Tong. Can we get her on the stage? Hello, and have a um, very good local time, everyone. And uh, Keith, uh, I was just looking at our ICRP interview. It was two and a half years ago. So very good to have a conversation again. Yeah, it's great to talk to you again as well. And uh, it's kind of interesting. The reason that she can read that interview that we did two and a half years ago is because she kind of turns the tables on all the reporters that talk to her. She records those interviews herself and makes them public for everybody. So that's another aspect of the radical transparency that uh, she brings to government. Yet another topic that we can touch on uh, in the course of this conversation. Now, where I want to start, though, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to find a through line to tie it all together. But where I kind of want to start, uh, Minister Tong, is in a lot of interviews that you give, uh, a word that comes up again and again is the term empathy. It seems to be kind of a core value, a core component of how you engage with the world. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit why it is that empathy and this, uh, this concept of empathy is something that's really central to what you're doing. Sure. So um, here in Mandarin, when we talk about the word listening, uh, it's also uh, transcribed as qing ting. Now, um, this word is very interesting because uh, ting literally just means hearing, but qing means tilt, tilting to one side. So um, when I listen to, to you or when I listen to anyone, it's very important to tilt toward that person uh, and step a little bit into that person's shoes in order for listening to truly happen. Otherwise, it's just hearing. It's not listening. And so as you can see, just in the Mandarin word of listening itself, it has this idea of being tilted to a side by the person that you're talking with. And then, of course, then we go back into our own identity and share what really happened during the tilting. So the other person also has a way to kind of fuse the horizons and know that where you're coming from. And so this culture of listening and part of democracy listening at scale, I think is the main difference between uh, tribalism, the populist tribalism, as well as populist democracy. And so I think that is one of the keys uh, toward a truly um, working with the people democracy, not just working for the people democracy. Interesting, listening at scale. I think that that's a really interesting way to put, at, uh, to put it and to put at the core of a lot of the work that you're doing. Now, another thing that, uh, another quote that comes up in a number of your interviews is the notion that you, this empathy may be linked to the fact that you've had two puberties. That's a line that you give, uh, you've given a number of times. Um, and just 
trying to, again, find a little bit of a through line here. Could you tell us a little bit about how your gender identity has mm. informed the work that you've done both inside and outside of government? Certainly. Well, well I'm post-gender, right? And I'm born with a um, condition that puts my testosterone level somewhere between um, average males and average uh, females. And so I did go through to puberty and that I think puts my mind into places of different resolutions that I can share a little bit of different landscapes of um, different relations to the body of how the body gets uh, resonating uh, with the environment and the social environment a little bit more. But I think <clears throat> more than that, of course, I also lived with the indigenous community for a bit. And I also, um, you know, learned Pearl and Haskell, which is two very different um, world views and things like that. And so all, all this, I think, informed this idea of intersectionality, meaning that you can find within yourself a bit of the place that we're kind of vulnerable, that were kind of different, but then you can put into words uh, the differences and then make it into a strength rather than purely a weakness. All right, so as promised, we're gonna be jumping around a lot in the first 20 minutes or so. So uh, cleaning the slate, switching gears entirely, let's talk a little bit about uh, civic hacking and your role bringing hacking into government. I know that right now ongoing is the Presidential Social Innovation Hackathon. And mm -hmm. this is interesting in the sense that the, there's no prize money in this hackathon. The prize is not accolades or, or some money that you get. The prize is knowing that your idea for how to make government better is actually going to be created. It's going to be made in the world. So the whole point is people coming together, trying to put their best ideas forward, and then very smart people in Taiwan hacking them together, making them a reality. So uh, I'll turn things back to you, Minister mm -hmm. Tong. If you could tell us a little bit about uh, this hackathon and maybe even highlight a couple of examples of what you're seeing this year to give us a better idea of what it's all about. Sure thing. So yeah, just yesterday, I met with international teams. This time, there's like 16 countries and seven uh, teams accepted. And so there's a domestic track and an international track. And so um, last year, we called it the Presidential Social Innovation Hackathon. But this year, we're redesigning the rules so that each of the 20 teams uh, in the domestic cohort need to be trilingual, meaning that they have to be a public servant in it. There has to be a technical expert in and there has to be a domain expert in it. And so we would have to call it the Presidential Public Social Private Hackathon, which doesn't quite rhyme. And so we decided to just call it the Presidential Hackathon. Now, the Presidential Hackathon last year uh, chose five winning teams. And exactly as Keith described, there really is no prize money. Um, but what we gave is a trophy. And a trophy is literally a projector. It, when you turn it on, it projects the visuals of the president herself handing the trophy to you. And so this is very useful, especially if you're a public servant, because then you can come up with wild ideas that with three months to prototype and no risk at all if it doesn't work. But if it does work, then the trophy carries the presidential promise of whatever you have demonstrated in the three months, we accept in the next year to make it into part of public service and maintain it basically forever. And so one of the cases last year was the water saviors because they save water, you see. The, the idea is that uh, in Taiwan Water Corporation, uh, they maintain one of the longest, actually the longest pipe uh, in the world. And uh, its water supply is usually through plastic lines in some places and they leak. And so they um, hire uh, the staff here that listens to the pipes and to determine whether they leak. Now, this is actually a very kind of not fulfilling job because most of the time they are not leaking. And so they enter a presidential hackathon and work with the domain expert and text experts to create a machine learning model and a chatbot that uh, the staff here can just wake up and receive through the chatbot the three most likely places near them. So they focus their energy on the creative part of the job, which is to figure out why the leak is happening and also how to collect leaks. And so this is uh, corresponds to the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Goals, 6-4. And so after New Zealand discovered that after the hackathon, they invite the same team to visit Wellington for three more months to also help them fix the same problem. And so basically with this trilingual teams, what we're getting at is the data collaboratives, meaning that everybody can contribute data to commons with distributed ledgers or other technology to make sure nobody can change each other's numbers. And then everybody can make something creative out of it. it this in itself is one of the SDGs. And so this year we use quadratic voting, which is a, you know, plain wild it has a perturbing thing um, that uh, allocates 99 points for every citizen and they can vote uh, on any of the 100 or so teams and one vote costs one points but if you want to vote some item two votes that's four points three votes nine points and so on and so we get a very balanced cohort of 20 teams that for example um, 
use other machine learning to find illicit financial flows or to use the water box, which is a IoT device to report uh, water pollutions between the farmlands and the plants and so on. And also we've got machine learning that automate the chart of determining sentencing for very mechanical legal cases like drunk driving and things like that. And so, yeah, this CS20 team is very balanced, I think, thanks to the help of quadratic voting and pop just popular ideas of getting the synergies out of those teams. And I would just want to check with uh, folks in the audience real quick. Can everybody hear okay? Nobody's having a hard time hearing? All right, perfect. Uh, just to linger on that point uh, for one second, I mean, when you have a hackathon, would you say that the important thing going on is the fact that you're bringing in technical experience, or is it just a matter of bringing a fresh ideas uh, to the problems? Because obviously there's a lot of smart people in government. I've met a lot of people in Taiwan's government. There's a ton of smart people. What mm -hmm. are the hackers bringing into the equation that wasn't there before? No, I think the idea is that we are making the hacker culture part of the public service culture as well. It's not about bringing in the hackers, it's about turning the public service into hackers, right? So um, I think uh, as Clay Shirky um, said, uh, the main thing about Hackathon is not a particular project, but actually social capital, the trust that is built among the team members. And so basically using the design of data collaboratives, which you can read all in datacollaboratives.org, um, it's brought people who previously has a reason to distrust each other, but discover that despite their different positions in different sectors, they actually share the common values. For example, the one case that I just mentioned um, is about people from the agricultural community wanting to know that the upstreams are not polluted, but it's also people from the industrial community wanting to prove that they are not polluting the farmlands. And it's also the local community. And the ultimate benefit is, of course, to the sustainable environment. And so while people may seem to have different positions, using distributed ledgers and this IoT device, make sure that everybody um, inch toward the common values. And that, I think, is the main contribution. And we're kind of expanding the term hackathon. Usually you think of hackathon, you think of two days, at most three days. But this is actually three months of work. And so this is more like mutual fellowship or reverse fellowship in a way. All right, so sticking with that notion of transparency and collaboration, uh, another topic that we wanna to touch on is uh, closely related digital democracy. You've developed a number of applications that are broadly trying to get more people into the process of making government, making policy, making laws. Uh, a couple of the most prominent ones would be GovZero, and VTaiwan, a couple of platforms that are helping get people involved in how the laws are actually getting made. Let's, uh, let's start with the basic basics here and tell us why is it important to get more people involved in the process of policy making? Sure. And, and what is, how does technology make that uh, more possible? Sure. So um, I would like to, at this point, quote Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, in her inauguration speech. Um, she said, before we imagined democracy as a clash between opposing values, but now democracy must become a conversation between diverse values. I think the latest term out from the UN is called COGAF or collaborative governance. But if you work in IETF or internet governance, you know it's just a rebranding. But in any case, yes. So uh, the opposition between uh, different values is what you traditionally get a, in a pre-internet governance system. You have the people caring about environmental sustainability on one side and people caring more about maybe economic development on the other side. You have people who care about emerging technologies and people who care about social justice. Um, I, I'm sure Uber is no um, you know, stranger to this debate. And the traditional way of imagining governance is that you find representatives, you organize yourselves, and you find maybe the ministers, right, uh, one on each side, uh, maybe minister for economy on one side and minister for interior on the other side, and then the public service in the middle, anonymous, absorb all the tensions uh, while trying not to break. And so this is basically the, the battle days. Now, um, I think it's important to have participatory governance exactly because there's just too, too much emerging issues. Um, next Monday, we're going to talk about, you know, hoverboards and segways and things like that. There, there was no rules about them because they frankly didn't exist when we write those rules. And not to mention self-driving vehicles and so on. And also, of course, vertical takeoff and landing, which is another Uber contribution. So what I'm trying to get at is that um, there's no traditional ministries or agencies or things like that for emergent issues. And it is actually uh, only works if the government knows that we have no idea. And that in the very beginning, in the agenda setting stage, ask people, what are your ideas? And try to figure out that it is actually not 
always about polar op opposites. So there may be like five things that are in contention, but actually people mostly agree with each other on most of things most of the time. And this shape, this kind of reflective shape, is why I think that it makes sense to have as much participation as possible at the very beginning, at the agenda setting stage, when the government has still knows nothing about anything, right? And then we figure out a norm, and then we make it into policy, and into code, and into law. And I do want to turn things over to the audience questions uh, pretty quickly, but just to make things a little bit more concrete here, uh, could you give us an example of a policy issue that has benefited uh, during your time in government from this process? The last time I spoke to you, uh, you talked to me about esports. Uh, I imagine there's been some other policy issues since then. Right. So, yeah, eSport is a really good one because there was no agency for eSport. And the Ministry of Culture used to say that they protect the traditional culture like Wei Qi, like Do, but not eSport. And the Ministry of Economy says that we care, take care of the equipment, not the athletes, quote unquote. And the Ministry of Education says it's nothing like physical education. There's nothing like sport. We don't have a division for that. But uh, through radical transparency and through this kind of multi-stakeholder meeting, we were able to find a precise definition of eSport that actually include Go, include Wei Qi, because um, if you play Go, you know, it's mostly play online now, and, and AlphaGo and AlphaZero actually is a great help um, to the art of Wei Qi, and so it, it's an eSport now. So uh, it makes sense to give all the benefits of Go players, the, those the benefits to the eSport players, and also redesign our curriculum, which starts this August, actually, to introduce, like, eSport schools that then gradually teach people media literacy, the uh, how to become a responsible YouTuber, and things like that. And so, yeah, yeah, since then, uh, we set up the Social Innovation Lab, which is a national lab for social innovation, and using this kind of multi-stakeholder meeting of the norm, policy, code, and law uh, sequence, uh, you do see those self-driving tricycles just roaming around in my office, and people co-create the norms around self-driving tricycles. For example, some people feel that it's too much like a cyclop, the shopping cut with AI. And so because it's open source and open hardware and open data, people just tinker to, for it to look uh, more palatable um, to the society. We call it co-domestication. And through the police system, which you briefly touched upon, we ask people what their feelings are about autonomous vehicles. And finally, Taiwan, um, starting next month, is going to roll out the first uh, in the world um, law that creates a sandbox for multimodal self-driving vehicles. So it could be something that drives and flies, it could be something that swims and then goes on the land, but it's all permitted to show the regulators, indeed everybody, for a year, uh, whether it actually solves their local problem or not. And if it does, then we just incorporate it into our policies. And if it doesn't work, well, we're thanking investors for paying the tuitions for everybody. It's open innovation after all. So what, whatever we do is a regulatory co-creation so that we don't have to uh, rule on something that we don't have first-hand experience of. And there's tons of experience just, just waiting to happen now uh, for self-driving vehicles all around Taiwan. All right. Well, uh, the very last topic that I want to touch on with you before we turn things over to the audience, uh, introduce it to the audience as something to chew over, uh, would be how to keep democracy strong and the institutions of democracy strong. I know that you're a reader of the classics and uh, somewhat philosophically minded, so I'm sure that this is something that you've thought a fair amount about. Uh, governments, uh, democratic governments across the world are, are struggling in this regard, and we're all facing very similar challenges. Uh, so I was not surprised to see that fake news is something that's on the mind of a lot of uh, folks in Taiwan government. And uh, I also saw that fake news is something that you're working on to develop some kind of response to at the governmental level. Although it also struck me that this is a very fraught topic whenever you bring up the term fake news and then want to bring government into the conversation, a lot of people are going to be worried, you know, what is the government's role in determining what is fake news and what is legitimate news? So as uh, somebody who is a conservative anarchist and uh, perhaps so, so, sometimes skeptical of the role of government, how do you think about this set of issues? Sure. So first, we don't use the word fake news because um, perhaps, unfortunately, news and journalism translates to the same word in Mandarin. And so, xinwen, right? So if we discredit uh, quote unquote fake news, then we also discredit journalism. But journalism mm -hmm. is the strongest protection against disinformation. It, this information is totally different from journalistic work. So um, we, we don't use that word because of ambiguities. And because both my parents are journalists, I cannot use the word out of filial piety, you know, about it. So basically, uh, we say disinformation. And we do have a, a, a legal definition for disinformation. Uh, it's called intentional harmful 
untruth. All three must match for it to be qualified as disinformation. And the harm is to the public, to the democratic system, exactly as you've said it, uh, not just to a minister's image, which is just good journalism, right? And so basically uh, what we're figuring out here is that we're preserving the value of being, according to Civicus Monitor, the Asia's only, actually, uh, totally free and open society in terms of that we don't harm the freedom of expression, we don't absorb the power back to the state because of this information. So what do we do? So there's three defenses and three um, proactive uh, measures, and I'll go through them really quickly. So um, the timely response, uh, inoculation as we call it, is actually the, the best way. Um, whenever there is a disinformation that's being detected, we make sure that each ministry is now equipped with sufficient personnel and authority to publish a clarification within an hour. And we make the clarification very viral. I'll use an example. There was a popular rumor that says perming your hair twice in a week will be subject to a one million fine. Huh. And then um, it, it went um, not quite viral, but we detected it. So the premier published this within an hour. And this is the photo of the premier when he was young. And he said, perming your hair will be subject to fine. It's not true. I may be bald now, said Premier Su, but I would not punish people like that. <laughs> and, and then um, there's a fine print that says, what we're actually doing is that we're introducing a labeling requirement for hair products, and it only takes effect uh, 2021. And then I didn't translate this bit, but what he said here, the Premier, as he looks like now, says, however, if you're perming your hair multiple times in a week, it will damage your hair. You may end up looking like me. And so <laughs> it is very funny. It went viral, right? Much more <laughs> viral than the, than the disinformation. And then um, people just find it genuinely funny. And it's good humor because he makes um, you know, fun of himself, not somebody else, right? And so we're, we're practicing this art for you know, two years now. And it's, it's getting to a point where we can reliably get out clarifications. So this is not a takedown. It's not censorship, right? It's just making sure that people read the clarification before they read the disinformation. And then we empower the social sector. There's an international fact-checking network of which there is a Taiwan member as well. And there's also a crowdsourced way to just look at end-to-end -end encrypted channels uh, like Line, which is like WhatsApp. Uh, and then people just start flagging uh, the uh, disinformation stale. So this is a lot like spun. Right, you can receive an email. Email is private communication. But if the email says, you know, um, I'm a princess somewhere, I have ten thousand, um, you know, dollars. If you just uh, uh, deposit, then I wire you one billion dollars or something like that. And then people would just flag it as spam. That's how the spams are solved, right? People voluntarily flag things as spam. It goes to spam house, to the DBL, and so on. And so the next time somebody spams, it lands to the junk mail folder, not the inbox. Again, it's not strictly speaking take down, right? But it just doesn't consume our attention as much. And so people who flag on Colfax uh, can get a robotic clarification immediately um, in their end-to-end -end encrypted channels. There's tens of thousands of people joining. And then the journalists at the IFCN, at the Taiwan Fact Check Center, then goes do a journalistic kind of fact check due diligence on that and publish the entire report publicly. And then Facebook dials down the virality of those things that are fact checked as false. And Line agrees to put out a clarification message on their Line today, which is like their social media. And all in all, just to make sure the loop is maintained by the industry and the social sector, not the government sector, but the public sector, the ministries are just one of the new sources in this equation. So we're not encroaching um, you know, freedom of exp expression. But of course, for democracy itself, we're saying you know, if you can vote, you must be a citizen. So in Taiwan, we have the, the world's most uh, transparent campaign donation laws, and everything is actually published as CSV, as Excel spreadsheets. So anyone can analyze campaign donors' profiles very easily. However, we didn't have uh, that same law for political advertisements. And so we are uh, changing the, the law and Facebook and so on have all agreed that they have to review uh, both the precision targeting criteria as well as who are making those advertisements. And it's just like anti-money laundering, everybody has to disclose where the money comes from. And if it ultimately comes from a non-citizen source, then it's up for a very large fine, like um, you know, a million dollars or more. And so I think those are the defenses, but for the uh, pro proactive measures we're taking, we're just making sure that everybody can meet me uh, every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And so uh, the face-to-face -face connection, the immediate response, I think that is uh, the most crucial. 
and 5,000 people doing e-petitions can get a response from the government very easily. And then the flagging and clarification also extends to all, like our president uh, who was visiting the line at the time um, and uh, enables us to uh, listen to all the different stakeholders and roll out very high quality TV series that doubles as media literacy curriculum and for the K-12 people to adapt into their uh, classrooms where I think I think the Asia spheres to introduce media literacy part of creative and uh, critical thinking not as a class but as a um, core competency to be introduced in all the classes. And so one of the premier um, curriculum uh, material we're using is actually the TV series, The Worlds Between Us, now on HBO Asia, critically acclaimed. So I'm very happy to hear that you're going to also watch it um, sometime uh, soon. All righty. So uh, that was all just by way of uh, setting the table for you guys. Now we're going to open up to the audience, hoping that there might be some folks out there ready to ask a question or two. Uh, there's a microphone right there that you can walk up to. If anybody has the courage or the questions to match, anybody? Oh, there's one Slido question. I see somebody walking up. Yeah, come on, come on. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Yes, claps for bravery. Will that be on camera if she goes up? Yes. It will be, yes. All right, great. Uh, hold, hold, uh, yeah. All right, uh, uh, could you say uh, your name and uh, just a little bit of, and then your question? Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. My I name is Janelle. Um, thank you for um, being here with us today, Audrey. Um, really appreciate that. Um, so my background is policy. I have degrees in policy. So I really admire your doing because I um, what you are doing through um, technologies is really um, embody, <clears throat> excuse me, embody textbooks context, like uh, through civic engagement um, or people can just vote and voice and also transparency. So um, this is really inspiring. Thank you for doing this. I'm kind of fangirl right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is, how did you educate? Um, I mean, how did you get this knowledge around uh, policy making, democracy? Um, where did you get um, inspiration? Um, okay, <clears throat> thank so my, you. My, my roots, yes. So as I mentioned, um, I think this uh, CoGov, this collaborative governance, is just a rebranding of internet governance. Um, when I was 14 years old, I dropped out of high school uh, and telling the principal of my junior high that I found that the human knowledge is being created on the web and all my textbooks are out of date. Uh, and so she actually looked at my exchange with uh, professors on archive.org um, and discovered that, oh, really, it is the case that you can now direct happily uh, access to cutting edge research rather than relying on the textbooks. So she said, okay, and then I quit school and then start some startups. And then I discovered this policymaking community um, that's IETF, that's uh, W3C, um, that's um, you know, ICANN, and later on Wikipedia, the Debian Constitution, and so on. And nowadays, of course, uh, Vitalik and Friends. And so uh, all this is a lineage of people experimenting with democracy that are more symmetrical, that are less about providing three bits every four years, which we call voting, you know, to, um, to the uh, ruling apparatus but rather real-time democracy that you can participate anytime just by way of having an email sending to a working group anywhere in IETF. And I joined the ATEM working groups and so on back then. And so, um, and remember that I was just 15 or 16 at the time, so I don't have even the right to vote. So that's my kind of tribe. That's the first democratic system, the first democratic institution that I'm introduced to. And then after that, after maybe five years, I finally started to, to vote. And to me, representative democracy, just like everybody else in my generation in Taiwan, comes with the wild web. We don't have a pre-wild web representative democracy. So internet democracy came roughly on the same year, and it's very deeply interlinked. 
And so when we think about the democratic institutions in Taiwan, a little bit like um, Estonia, I guess, we don't have as much legacy to think about. And so we always have representative democracy, but with participatory um, sides in it. And so I'm also inspired by an early FAQ online called the Anarchist Frequently Asked Questions. And it collects all the different anarchistic thoughts uh, across the ages. And I was also a early um, participant in the Freenet community, part of the cypherpunk movement. And the cypherpunk, while being very individualistic, uh, eventually turned social. And eventually, um, a lot of people are starting to think of mechanism design, market design, things that are more soft uh, than violence, that is to say state violence, and that can nevertheless shape people's behavior to be more pro-social. So that's roughly speaking my roots. All right, anybody else want to jump in with a question? This is, yep, come on, uh, come right ahead. Hi there. Um, I've been asked to uh, relay a couple of questions from some people that prefer not to be on the camera, Minister, so I'll do that yeah. first. Um, they would like to ask, um, what is your Chinese name and how did you uh, get your English name? How did you choose your English name? Okay, um, so that's the two questions. All right, um, so uh, my uh, traditional Chinese name uh, is, is written here. Uh, so it's called Tang Feng, uh, and Feng meaning Phoenix. Uh, and but specifically male phoenix, but it's in recent um, yes being repurposed to mean female phoenix. Uh, but in any case, so it's it's a post gender word. I chose this word to represent the fact that I'm post gender. That any pronoun, uh, my official pronoun is whatever. So call me whatever. But in any case, um, there there really is a kind of correspondence uh, to the English name Audrey, uh, which used to be a neutral name until Audrey Hepburn started using the name. Uh, and so that's the my my uh, Chinese name. And so uh, my English name um, nowadays, my colleagues just call me AU, uh, which is a um, kind of uh, both uh, the prefix of Autrichus, which was my previous English name and Audrey, which is my current English name. And this came from Adreyu, which is um, the Never Ending Stories protagonist. <laughs> it's a great source material for names. Yeah, was there another part to that question? And then I have a completely different question for myself. Um, so I thought it was really interesting um, at the beginning of the, the discussion, you were talking about um, populist democracies versus populist sort of tribalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I used to work at change.org, which is a popular e-petition site. Yes. Um, and I think one of my observations from sort of uh, government stuff in the US is that um, in many ways, change.org enables people to have a voice where they don't have one, but mostly it's by kind of creating a very loud voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I love the work that they do and I love the work that they support, but often uh, increasingly politicians simply don't read the email because the sort of barrier to entry on e-petitions is so low that they have decided in many cases that, you know, the sort of the, the information they're receiving from constituents that way isn't sufficiently interesting to kind of, uh, to, to be used. On mm -hmm. the flip side of this, in, in the States, um, we saw a massive effort by the, the American Republican Party to use large data to sort of figure out how to redistrict uh, in America and kind of change the political landscape um, by using data in a way that um, uh, I, I, would, I would say is very anti-democratic um, from my own perspective um, because they were using it to kind of restrict in a way that, that meant that party would win uh, a majority of seats with, with a minority of votes. Um, so how would you sort of um, approach these new technologies such that inevitably having uh, lower friction communication with decision makers doesn't necessarily enable, um, you know, minority communities or, um, you know, sort of underrepresented peoples to have a larger voice, it simply allows more communication. And at the same time, you know, sort of detailed data analysis helps, um, you know, sort of us have much better information to inform policy if we want to, but it also enables really bad sort of uh, policy decisions if people choose to use it that way. So what are the things that you think of to kind of fight this? Yeah, so it is um, indeed true uh, that whatever we're seeing, um, it has a divisive side, sometimes very loudly, 
but also a side with consensus or rough consensus, as we prefer to call it in internet governance. The thing is that the mainstream media and social media at this current generation uh, really over focuses on maybe just one thing or maybe three things that are divisive. And it's our job to make sure that everybody sees the commonalities, the common values, despite the different positions. And one of the powerful way for interaction design to intervene is actually just to take away the reply button. In the POLIS system, there is no reply button because when we have found, also in Slido, there's no reply button. Um, whenever there is a reply button, whether it's on ePetition or Slido or POLIS, people with the most time wins by default. They can just keep trolling and, uh, you know, now that we have talked to a transformer, um, you know, it's entirely automated. And so it's basically a, a lost cause if you have the traditional kind of bulletin board system conversation, but rather by having only AFO and downvotes and visualizing the upvotes and downvotes in a way that lets people find their commonalities, we can highlight both the wrong slide, sorry, uh, we can, but that's maybe also relevant. Uh, we can highlight both um, the commonalities that people want to care about, in this case, radical transparency around budgets, around regulations and e-petitions, but uh, which makes the state completely transparent to the people. When you make the state completely transparent to the people, when you publish data as soon as you collect, that is public, not privacy data, and uh, publish the decision-making process, not just the results of decision-making, Everybody becomes a decision maker. Everybody who read my transcripts actually just freely email me saying that, oh, minister, you get something wrong. This should be like that and so on. And I wouldn't ever have that input if I don't make all my early discussions and drafts and interviews like this public. So making the state public to the system is my first answer. I think radical transparency really is the key to share the agenda setting power. This is unlike some other systems which make the citizens transparent to the state, which I would not get into to too much detail. But in any case, um, the other thing that you said, which is very important, is the signal noise ratio uh, of public participation. And again, what we're offering to the public service is essentially having the crowd, crowd moderate um, their ideas so that the entire picture is seen in a kind of overview effect, not just uh, being kept uh, by those, uh, you know, uh, trolls or things that just flood the forum, um, as you may very well know. And so basically, if you get 5,000 people voting exactly the same way on polis, it's just one dot here. It doesn't change the landscape because we measure plurality, diversity. We don't measure the head counts. And so even this number says, you know, 2,000, it, it doesn't change the shape at all. And so it makes sure that the minorities, people who hold very strong views, but are different from everybody else, get a fair representation. It's not a representation because you know representatives, right? But there's a representation of their ideas, even though they may number in the lower hundreds or even less. And so having the system designed in such a way that visualizes the minority and making the minority also see that they have actually something in common with the majority, I think that can break us free from this, uh, you know, half of the population loses every four years cycle because everything is real time. You can start this conversation literally every day. I want to go to some of the questions that we're getting online, but uh, really briefly kind of on this topic, I, I found uh, another interesting thing that you, you sometimes say in interviews that you think that we should do more troll hugging on this topic and that there, there is a better way to engage with trolls. Uh, how do you engage with people that are spewing negativity in these forums? Sure. So uh, troll hugging is my, is my hobby. Um, so just like XKCD. Uh, if you uh, type uh, my hobby, troll hugging, you will find my post uh, from, <laughs> from eons ago. But um, so to be, to be very precise, I, I think what really uh, makes trolls, uh, motivate trolls, I'm talking about human trolls, not bot trolls, which is a different um, you know, species altogether. But in any case, what I'm trying to get at is that whenever trolls troll people, basically they crave for attentions long-term attentions that they cannot get from the uh, social setting. And so they get attention, but those attentions are transactional. They're not relational. And I'm saying, I'm not saying it's not creative. Just look at 4chan. They could be very creative, but then it's transactional. So it doesn't sustain. It's like junk food. So the next morning they wake up, they still feeling very empty and troll somebody else, right? And so that's the basic psychology of troll formation. And so my, my counterpoint to this very simply is that if there's a 
300 word uh, post that address me personally uh, on social media or any other places. Um, I do a Kibo search. Um, if you are um, recognize this name, you're really old. Uh, but uh, basically anyone who mentions me by name and trolls me, I only respond to maybe the five word that can be construed as constructive. And I ignore totally everything else. And so it teaches people that you can actually gather relational um, attention if you contribute your own authentic experience to it and only pay attention to these things. And for people who are really toxic in the use of their words, if I feel hurt by their words, then I just make sure that I um, enjoy some new music, enjoy some new coffee or tea, and associate this um, you know, visual stimuli with a non-visual stimuli that is, pres uh, that is pleasant. It's called cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and so basically the next time that I wake up, if I sleep sufficiently that night, and then I wake up with a new association form in my brain. So the next time I see this word, I think of something very pleasant. So now I look at trolls and I feel pleasant all the time. So, <laughs> so, so just make sure to publicly only respond to the part that are authentic. And sometimes they just come and visit me in the social innovation lab on Wednesdays. This is my office. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think that the, these are some words for all of us to live by, not just uh, good advice for digital ministers. Uh, we have some questions online, but we've also got some folks lining up right now. So we'll try to get to the physical people first. We'll try to get to you folks online as well. Uh, gentleman right there, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is James Chang. I'm from Berkeley, California. I just want to start off by saying um, uh, since uh, President Tsai got elected, uh, and thanks to her leadership and also her utilizing leadership such as yourself, Minister Tang, I've never been more proud to be Taiwanese American and thank you so much for that. Um, and I, I just also just wanna say that someone who works in public service, um, it, you know, with the recent passage of marriage, marriage equality, especially with the leadership of President Tsai and the DPP, um, I really just wanna say that um, as a public service person myself, uh, it's politics is often about courage and doing what's right and protecting the vulnerable not necessarily about what is popular, um, really so. And, on, and I'm not sure exactly how much you can talk about politics, but I wanted to know how exactly we can support this current administration and President Tsai in regards to a political opposition on issues such as uh, marriage equality. Mm -hmm. And in terms of technology, I noticed that uh, President Tsai has been uh, doing amazing jobs uh, uh, on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, and especially on YouTube. Y'all should subscribe to your page. It's really amazing. Uh, uh, but I also know that uh, WeChat is a great, uh, not great, but a really big uh, influential uh, um, medium of social media in Taiwan. And we know that in a lot of closed spaces, there is a lot of disinformation. Uh, I was just wondering what uh, President Tsai and administration plans on doing in tackling those type of spaces. Sure. Well, it is WeChat is great, it's just evolving in a different direction. Right? Um, so in any case, well, what we're uh, looking at is, is two things. Uh, first, exactly as you said, uh, the social media uh, campaigns that Dr. Tsai and also Premier Su with the great humor uh, is rolling out, I think really um, speaks to the younger generation, to the internet generation. But I also think that it is essential that we spend more time with uh, the elderly, with people of a um, elder generation, because they have a very different take on marriage. Uh, actually, before 2007, Taiwan was a social um, marriage law, right? It's a marriage by ceremony law. You don't have to register. You just hold a big wedding, and it's a thing between two families. But um, after 2008, it's just marriage by registration. So younger people think of marriage as a purely just like filing your tax, maybe not like filing your tax, but a administrative act. But in any case, uh, what is important is that when people go to um, debates, they look at marriage, but think of drastically different things. And so I think it's also very creative that we invented this idea of uh, which means um, legalizing marriage equality of all the bylaws, but none of the in-laws. I think that's the right translation or an approximation of it. So basically in the civil code, the section about in-laws, about the family relationships doesn't quite apply because we have 16 words for aunts and uncles. But uh, then <laughs> those words doesn't apply, but the, all the bylaws, all the rights and obligations do apply. And so with this eclectic solution, we now have a much better way to communicate with the elderly of the part of the marriage that they care, the kinship, 
the filial piety, the the sixteen with for uh, aunts and uncles, uh, they they are not harmed um, by the marriage equality. And so that's I think the uh, message that we need to repeat to rebuild intergenerational solidarity. And the second thing you mentioned about into an encrypted channels, um, I would like to also to point out it's not just uh, government that can do clarifications. If you go to COFAX. Uh, cofax.g0v.tw, it's actually everybody can participate in the fact-checking process. Everybody, it's just like flagging spot. Anybody can flag something as disinformation and everybody can participate in the clarification uh, effort. And so if you're a professional journalist, consider joining the International Fact-Checking Network. But if you're just an enthusiast, still feel free to contribute to the Cofax. Uh, and none of these two projects is sponsored in any way by the government. They're entirely in the social sector. It's by empowering the social sector that can we avoid the zero-sum gain between the private sector platforms and the public sector governments. All right, let's take uh, the next question from the gentleman in the leather jacket. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Alan. I just moved from Taiwan. And thanks for your speech. Yeah, uh, so I have two questions. One is like, uh, big data is a very powerful tool, but how can we make sure when they do that the data is pure, it's like not changed by other people, maybe other party, they have their personal interests. Uh, based on like before the selection, we always have a like, lot of like Austrian poor result, like Ming Diao is like, very ridiculous. They said, you know, they have, a, they have a purpose. So how can we make sure like when they collect data, it's like pure, it's like, not fed by any person or like, parties that like, interest. And second one is let's, like- uh, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a chance to ask the second one. Let's take, take that one first. Uh, so yeah, how do we keep our sources of data pure and, and not corrupted? Well, polls are, are by definition not big data, right? It's a sample, it fits into a computer, so it's not big data. But so, so I'll treat this as two questions. So um, if you have big data, meaning that it's not a sample, it's just data as it happens, it's collected on site. Uh, the best way to keep, I wouldn't say immutability, if you want immutability, use a blockchain, but it, the accountability of data is very important. Uh, this is why data governance is the primary product of our presidential hackathon. So look again at this shape. Everybody in Taiwan can set up measurements of air pollution anywhere. Actually, more than 2,000 people already do, sometime in primary schools as education materials. And if you have a shape that looks like this, that is entirely in the social sector, everybody can set up those air boxes and keep each other honest. It's not even blockchain, although they use distributed ledgers, but it's just by way of having people who can verify and uh, um, participate in data stewardship that you can have big data that is uh, partially owned and entirely governed by the collaborative relationship. And we have this shape for air box and very soon for water box. And the state's um, position here is always we can't beat them, we must join them, right? So we asked the data stewards, sometime primary school uh, children, to, to say, you know, where would you like air boxes, but you really cannot set up one? And they tell us uh, maybe in industrial parks because they're private property. Well, it turns out we own the lamps in, in those industrial parks. So we just hang some air boxes there. Or people say, you know, we want to tell domestic versus over the street uh, pollution. So we want a spot here, but it's in the middle of water, right? If you can fly drones, it runs out of battery. But it turns out we're building renewable energy, wind turbines there. So we can also change the contract to say, oh, you have to hang an air box there. What I'm trying to get at is that accountability is a social construct. It is not something that can purely be mathematically proven. So if you build a collaborative like this, what you earn is trust from the different sectors participating in the collection, in the use of big data. And it's only through this that you can have a partnership that uh, ensures trust. Otherwise, if you have the best mathematics, if you have NK you know, proofs and things like that, people can still challenge you just not because of the math, but because that you, they, they are not part of the players. They can, have no way to participate and verify that it's true by participation. So I would argue still participation and collaborative relationship is the only way that I know of to ensure the accountability of big data. And finally, polls. Yeah, polls are just really gained in, in Taiwan, right? So um, I don't think polls with a fixed set of uh, questions can ever represent the true um, upload bandwidth of what people feels like because the survey is pre-selected. Now, 
if you can think of polis a little bit, it is actually like a poll, except all the survey questions are crowdsourced, meaning that people just post whatever they feel like for other people to respond to. Now, if it's a wiki survey like this, then we do see that over time, people evolve into a kind of rough consensus, but it's like humming, right? You have to make it run long enough. So it's a continuous relational process, not a one-shot transactional process. If you only have transactional processes and you do publish the results, then the, the theory of double hermeneutics basically means that you cannot ever uh, just uh, use that as a true representation of the society. All right, and uh, we said we'd give you one more question, so go ahead. So my second question is more about like uh, disinformation. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, because now we have like internet, so like a young generation or like some people use the internet, we have a chance to get information from not just TV channel. So mm -hmm. because in Taiwan we have problems that our TV channel, they have their side. So mm -hmm. sometimes they will just know like what they were going to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think I see they have like the generation like conversation, like they will have like a big war between like some people use internet and some people don't use internet. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, how do you fix this problem? Well, numbers tells us that everybody use the internet. Actually, people who are in 65 years old use it actually more, I guess, because they have more time. But the thing is that even though they're online, they're mostly only online, <laughs> so, which is the end-to-end -end encrypted system. Uh, right, so, so that's, that's where the, the problem is, which is why we need to partner with LINE to have the clarifications posted online today. But whatever uh, vehicles they use, because in Taiwan, we do have broadband as human right. Anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's my fault, you can talk to me. And so it's also very affordable, right? 15 US dollars gets you unlimited 4G connection anywhere in Taiwan. And all this combined means that people tend to use a much more streaming video, much more FaceTime or Skype or, or whatever uh, OTT video conversations. So there really is a lot of message that is just synchronous. It's not asynchronous as we imagined from the bulletin board era, but it's all synchronous. So it's better seen as a different town hall as a different kind of tribal gathering of people who share the same ideas. In, in this case, we cannot ask them to come to our website, to come to our technology, right? We have to go where people are. We have to bring social technology to people. And this is actually why I make sure that every other Tuesday or so, so we already said that every Wednesday you can come to visit me, every other Tuesday or so, I actually visit the people who are least likely to go to my office hour, the rural places, indigenous nations, and so on. But when I meet the local people, the municipalities, Taipei, Taichung, Kaohsiung, Taoyuan, and so on, and now Taichung and Huarian, all join through Zoom uh, video presence as we are using now. And all the different central ministries people are in the social innovation lab in Taiwan, all the 12 ministries. In Mandarin, we have a saying, 见面三分情. You build 30% of trust just by meeting face to face. And through high bandwidth video connection, maybe we build 20% of trust. So basically, uh, it makes sure that central authorities don't see those people as tribes, but rather as people participating in democracy and share their outrage, their hopelessness, their, their disempowerment, their personal stories. And they won't say, oh, I'm just a minister of interior. I will forward your ideas to the Ministry of Education, I'll forward your idea to the Ministry of Economic Development, which invariably gets compressed into A4 papers that lose all the human touch. Everybody here sees immediately what the personal story is about. And I serve as a facilitator locally to make sure that they can also interpret what the central government has to say. And the central government then, they cannot say, okay, I will copy the Minister of Education because the MOE is literally sitting right next to them. And everything is radically transparent, published after 10 working days of co-editing. And so this is a continuous democracy, not just real time, but continuous democracy that brings the central government literally into where people are. And then they can spread the updated clarifications, the jointly made sandbox uh, or e-petition details to the people in their community group without having to ask them to come on our website. So it's vastly more important to bring tech to people than asking people to come to tech. Right, and we thank you for the question. Uh, I'm being told that some of our friends that are messaging in from overseas, are many of them need to start work soon. So we're gonna take a couple of their questions. We'll do our best to get to the folks in line as well. 
Uh, so let's uh, look at the one that has right now two upvotes. Uh, we'll read yours because you have two upvotes. The question is, do you think evolution and equality are in conflict with each other? That's an interesting philosophical question, isn't it? Um, evolution means that you know, we adapt to best fit the environment um, as a group socially. And equality means that within a group that we don't uh, let one voice dominate the other voices. So I think they're not strictly in conflict. A group that is more equal, meaning that people who care more about the common goods actually is, has a better chance of surviving. But why these may seem conflicting with each other is of the different planning horizons. If you only plan for the next quarter, for example, then it would seem that people who are more caring more about economy and people who care more about long-term environment good and things like that are seemingly in opposition to each other. But if you think about the stakeholder that have yet to be born, if you think about capital investments that expect to return after a generation or two, then suddenly they, they actually align very well with each other. So I think this is what we are calling a post-GDP imagination. It's not that GDP is bad, it's just GDP is used with a very short planning horizon. So when we think of the sustainable development goals, which are 10 years from now, we naturally align evolution and equality better just because of the longer planning horizon. Interesting. All right. We're going to take one more uh, online question right now, then ping pong back and forth a little bit. I'm going to encourage folks that are online to cast your votes for which ones you want to see the most. Uh, that'll help guide us in which ones we should answer, because unfortunately, we're not going to have time for all of them. So do cast your votes to let us know what is most interesting to you. Topping the list right now is how distant is the future of enabling democratic voting through blockchain technology? Well, I mean, Identity technology, as I prefer to call it, blockchain is just one of the ways to, to socially build identities outside of state. Um, of course, democratic voting is already used. The presidential hackathon used quadratic voting. Uh, and Colorado actually uh, you also used quadratic voting in traditional representative democracy. Um, and uh, full disclosure, I am director, one of the director of the board of the Red Hill Exchange. And we just had our Taipei meetup uh, with Vitalik and Jennifer and friends. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic optimistic about that. I think the social innovation of alternate imagination of institutions doesn't have to wait till state implement it. You can implement it on a township level, on a community level, on a level of devolution that everybody socially know each other. And then you can collectively say, hey, let's try uh, distributed ledgers. Let's try Agora voting. Let's, let's try quadratic voting and, and things like that. And then after it works well on a community. This is how Time Bank started, right? Then it eventually gets noticed by the upper levels and it can get surprisingly quick if you prove to the uh, people working in public service that it uh, reduces their chores. They don't have to shuffle papers around, that it increases accountability, that credit goes where credit is due, and then the mechanism absorbs all the risk. And for emergent issues like public um, voting on participatory budget, because there is no election law on participatory budgeting. We're actually very open to experiment with i-voting and blockchain voting and all these things like that. And, and then for referendums, we're also for electronic tallying, not connecting to the internet, but electronic tallying uh, for a referendum, again, because it's uh, voting for things, for issues, not for people. If you vote for the president or for your mayor, uh, we are much more conservative because it has exponential return, you see. And so basically we try things on issues, but Taiwan is very progressive and we are indeed looking at that for voting on issues and budgets. All right, uh, we're gonna turn things back to the folks in the room who have been very patient. Uh, we can get the mic to work with us. Yeah, hi, um, thank you for joining us. Um, you've emphasized how open government is important, and I agree, but when you first... Maybe uh, turn the mic down towards, your, towards yourself. Uh, there you okay, go. Cool. Yeah. Uh, when you first start at a place with very little trust, how do you begin building trust? Like, do you see it incrementally or uh, in a design way? And when you were starting your work, was there a lot of resistance to that from people who might want to keep it opaque? And how did you deal with that? Mm -hmm. So great questions all. Um, I'll answer the second part first. So my three working condition uh, is uh, location independence, meaning that anywhere I'm working, I'm working. 
uh, and that extends to everybody on my staff. So we have people working from London, from Madrid, from uh, Toronto, and then all places. And this also enables me to basically uh, be the digital minister, but still then also work for international nonprofits like the, I don't know, Governance Lab, Digital Future Society, and the Radical Exchange lately, and things like that. And so this is very um, important to just keep the network making power alive uh, without getting constrained into a within in network power. That's the first thing. The second thing is radical transparency. Um, and I learned this, of course, uh, from internet governance. Because internet governance, you know, the internet doesn't have a Navy, it doesn't have an Air Force. Um, but I mean, the, the reason why I can or IETF or Internet Society is not absorbed into any UN or multilateral arrangement is precisely because of radical transparency that it builds a different set of legitimacy that still are more legitimate because it's more democratic than democratic states. And so this kind of radical transparency when applied to the place where there's very little trust means that I get to talk with people like David Plouffe, uh, speaking for Uber at the time, um, in a radically transparent fashion. And for everybody else in the different stakeholder groups, read the asynchronous transcript, knowing that it's precisely what happened. And then they can reformulate their theory of mind uh, and to reflect their positions and things like that. So even asynchronously, radical transparency does build trust. And finally, it's voluntary uh, association. And so it's a, the anarchist part of conservative anarchist. So voluntary uh, association means that I, I don't ever issue orders or take orders as a minister. So I always say that I work with, not for the, go the government. Uh, and basically that means that my staff, there's no ministry uh, and everybody rank and score themselves actually, uh, is entirely horizontal. And so Taiwan has 32 vertical ministries, each was a vertical minister, but above which there's nine horizontal ministers. I'm one of them. And my office is one person poached from each ministry so they can send delegates. But if they want to send another one, they have to rotate. And so currently I have 22 colleagues, meaning that no, not all ministry have sent people. Like Minister of Defense never sent anyone. I wonder why. Uh, but anyway, so basically that means that I don't force the Minister of Defense to start adopting radical transparency. It may or may not be you know, a few decades uh, before they can actually do that. But in any case, uh, I don't force it to people. And so in a very Taoist uh, way, people come to this way of working, in the flow of work, working out loud, because they have messages that they want the society to resonate with. So pretty much all the public facing ministries, the Ministry of Education, of Culture, Interior, Communication, and so on, all send people. Uh, and foreign affairs because public diplomacy, uh, all of these people agree to work out loud precisely because they want to resonate with other ministries. So that I don't ever give orders, which is why I don't meet resistance. Again, the very Taoist notion. All right, and we thank you for the question as well. Uh, we have, we're gonna go back to online and then we'll go right back to you uh, up next, so you're on deck. Uh, we have one question that has four upvotes. So the most voted for question yet. Uh, the question is incredible story, totally inspiring. How do you expect the Chinese government culture of social monitoring will unfold on the mainland and beyond? So I, I, I suppose we're sort of returning to this uh, anxiety that a lot of these technologies we're discussing today can be used for other purposes as well. Yeah, they're dual use, right, to reappropriate the term. So any case, um, yeah, for people on the Chinese continent, um, I actually had a slide uh, about this, right? While we're making the state transparent to people, they're making the people transparent to the state in an unaccountable fashion. Uh, while we're making through sandboxes and presidential hackathon to make sure that the norms, make sure the norms enter the society that informs regulation and then the state power. Uh, what they're doing is setting up a party branch in every large enterprise, thereby ensuring that the state power is actually leading the enterprise, so-called Guo Jinmin Tui, right? So in, in many different cases, I think we can see that we're evolving very quickly um, opposite directions. And so um, I, I think the current <coughs> outward projection of the PRC government is more of a projection of insecurity because they're not totally sure that this way of governance actually can, can sustain. And indeed, nobody knows. But um, the recent example in Hong Kong, for example, gives us some evidence that the other radical extreme being totally leaderless 
being Bruce Lee-like, you know, being like water, being formless, actually has a good chance of still coping and indeed triumph um, in a state monitored, state censored, uh, state intermediate environment. So I'm, of course, all um, very closely watching the evolution as we speak. And I do give classes, actually public classes, that are well attended by, say, people in Hangzhou, people in Sichuan, um, people in uh, the PRC uh, governed territories. And so I, I have all the hope of people who work on democratic procession still find a way to make it grow within that currently not very fertile ground. And I think thinking in long term, um, the so-called uh, central authorism uh, will yield to a way, even despite social monitoring, if you still allow free for flow of information on the internet, no matter through how, however many layers of VPNs and tours and things like that. So fundamentally, you have a certain amount of faith that more eyes on these problems will make them better. That's right. I, I mean, if you look at Hong Kong, it's the journalists and um, in many times uh, foreign correspondents that are kind of on the first line and that supports the right of communication, the right for free speech and so on. Not unlike how people under the Gov Zero banner did during the Sunflower Evolution. Um, so I think that is uh, really what's needed. If there is no journalism, if there is no people ensuring the right to communication and especially private communication, then I can see that uh, people would feel hopeless. But I do think that we can find a way even in pockets of free com com conversation even within the intranet, you can still set up secure communications. Uh, and like, personally, I use Sandstorm in all my, um, you know, uh, matters within the, the ministries uh, and within the public government. But the Sandstorm can be also used as a way to set up um, kind of um, private conversations, even within the internet that is blocked from outside connection. All right. And uh, we're going to turn over to the last guy in line. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I want to ask you um, about uh, the uh, the echo chamber effect nowadays, mm -hmm. especially uh, specifically to how to break the echo chamber. Uh, so there are lots of situations right now in Taiwan. It's like uh, the DPP supporters trying to figure out a way to reach out to the other side, which is the Han wave supporter or the nationalist or KNG supporter, how to you know have them to embrace this more progressive value. Uh, same thing happened here in U.S. Like we are scratching our head, trying to you know how to reach out those diehard Trump fans. Uh, or would you recommend like we we should not reach out to the people at the the opposite side of the most extreme of the spectrum? Like we should grasp. The people in the middle, they uh, don't have much idea about like who to listen to um, and how like if technology can play in a role, uh, I think to fit into today's thing. Um, like, can we ask like the social media company say, hey, hey don't give us so, mu so many homogenous uh, posts or articles, give us a little bit next here and there. Uh, what's your take? Okay, um, so first of all, I would like to recommend the Facebook feed eradicator to you. Uh, this is what I use on all my browsers, uh, and it's very, very useful. Um, it says what it says on the tin, it eradicates the news feed, uh, and replace it with a quote, this time from Adler, but you can also customize the quote. So, <laughs> all right, but the, I'm not joking though. Uh, this, this is like an ad blocker. This is like a um, spam filter on a client slide before we have very good domain blocking lists. Uh, this protects your mind from the uh, forced perception of echo chamber and polarization. And this is important because this, the feed is the only part in Facebook, and I think Zuckerberg does agree, that is designed to be addictive, to uh, trigger the dopamine cycle of addiction and thereby creating a little bit positive, it's like a little bit of liquor, but when overdosed, uh, creates pure negative externalities on the society. So just by turning off the feed, as I do, I still use Facebook much like a browser. Right? I, I search, I go to a group, I go to an event, I watch my um, friends' live streams and so on, but they're all intentional. I do something, I expect to see the result, but I'm freed from this, um, 
symbiotic AI, or it's not symbiotic, parasitic AI, that uh, just gets my attention for, for no good externalities. And so that, that's my first kind of personal level um, defense against the dark arts uh, for, for the echo chamber. Um, now, uh, on the more social side, um, we are actually making sure that alternate social networks in Taiwan, the largest one for public discussion is actually PTT and Descartes. Uh, and PTT in particular is not for profit, is academic, is open source, is uh, community governed. And so making sure that those communities have more spotlight and also make sure that uh, people, as you mentioned, who kind of categorizes people as kind of diehard fans of certain people, you can still find pe more reasonable people within them that are willing to talk about common goals. Um, we held 50 or so collaboration meetings, one of which that I still remember is that people who want to change the time zone of Taiwan to GMT plus nine. Uh, and there's another 8,000 that petitioned for it to remain uh, GMT plus eight. And so internally, we call these two like 16,000 people <clears throat> in total, uh, uh, which is um, <laughs> difficult to translate. But in any case, <laughs> right, the plus eight and plus nine um, uh, petition. So we invited actually both sides petitioners. And it turns out that they actually, after going through the scientific um, rationale, saving energy, increasing tourism, and then found out that it's actually not true. We have to spend a large one-time cost and a non-trivial recurring cost. But we can always ask, what are the most abstract things that both sides agree on? In, in this time, what they both agree on is they want Taiwan to be seen more unique in the world. It's just one side thinks changing time zone is a great way because it forces people who travel from the PRC to adjust their clock even though I, I think software would do that for them, it's not very useful. But uh, then um, the other side points out, it would only get 15 minutes of international news. And the other side would just say one country, two systems. And, and, then, and then, you know, there's many countries with different time zones, right? So it doesn't work. So uh, the implementation details differ, but both of them want someone to be seen as more unique. So we can ask actually better questions by indeed asking whether, uh, what kind of implementation can make Taiwan more uniquely seen in the world. And if asked this way, everybody is very weaker, eager to contribute. People say something about um, integrating with the Indo-Pacific, thinking about sharing our stories on good governance, public health, environmental sustainability, about uh, our tolerance of religious freedom and diversity and indeed marriage equality and everything like that. And so then people put their negative energy to positive use, to constructive use, and all 16 thousand people then agreed that this is the direction that we should go. So always step back and ask these five different positions, are they common values? And if you ask that question quick enough and sustain the questions, then you can build what we call a small world network between the different quote unquote camps that people can see through those mediators who are actually caring about very similar things. And so if you're interested in that kind of nonviolent communication, there's of course books like Dynamic Facilitation and so on that can help you along that road. And that is what, why I constantly wear this shirt that lists all the 17 different values that is the sustainable human goals to remind people that no matter which slides you're on, actually the other 16 slides are actually working toward the same common value that is sustainability. All right, and I think that that's a great last question for this evening. Uh, we thank you for it. Uh, before we say goodbye to Minister Tong, I want to thank the folks that put this on. First of all, of course, uh, we want to <laughs> we want to thank uh, Ruth Flores with uh, Uber. So let's uh, give a round of applause to Uber and the team over there. And of course, uh, the guys in AV that got this all hooked up. I know that this was a bit of a challenge this evening. So uh, round of applause to them as well. Uh, and of course, uh, thank Nancy Lin for putting this together. And uh, you, you guys know where to find out more about Taiwan Cafe. Great organization, good way to get involved. Uh, as somebody who uh, myself wants to stay connected to Taiwan as much as possible, I, I think it's an actually an excellent resource for those of us uh, who are a bit disconnected at the moment. So uh, Nancy Lin, uh, give a round of applause to her as well. And uh, finally, of course, we want to thank the star of the hour, uh, Digital Minister Audrey Tong. Thank you so much. It was very great talking with you. And thank you for the great questions. And have a good local time. Thank you. I hope this was a good start to your day.
<laughs> All right. Well, it is. It really is. And I'm looking forward to the recording. We're going to publish this on YouTube. And I would like to also thank journalists from the BBC Click, who is actually covering this from my office. Oh, fantastic. All right. We're getting a lot of coverage today. Well, one more round of applause for everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. And I guess we're signing off.